Okay, so this is week two of our series with Joseph and his brothers. It's a story, as we heard, full of drama and passion. And part of the bigger story of the people of Israel who descended from this family and who God is working on and shaping develop, to de- and developing to bring the good news of God uh, to the whole world. So today we see the strange and beautiful way that God continues to be with Joseph even in the worst of circumstances. Will you pray with me? Creating God, who knows what it is to be human, who dwells closer to us than breathing, you are always with us, and yet we don't always know it. Open us up to your presence and free us up to serve you and bring about your beautiful new world order. We pray trusting in your grace. Amen. So Joseph has had to grow up a lot since we first met him in our story from last week. He was the second youngest son of 12 brothers, but the first in his father Israel's love. And Israel didn't try to hide that fact, which led to a horrifying confrontation with the older brothers and ended with the brothers at home faking their death, his death to their father and Joseph sold into slavery in Egypt. And that is where we find Joseph today, working his way up the slave hierarchy and demonstrating a real gift for administration. As the story tells us, God was with Joseph, blessing everything that he did. Potiphar, his owner, recognizes that Joseph has something special. Perhaps even that Joseph's God is blessing him and uses that insight to his advantage, promoting Joseph to the top and leaving everything in his care. Joseph has authority, respect, trust, and a relatively comfortable way of life, given that he's a slave and a young man in his 20s. As the story says, God was with him. But then comes today's test. When we first meet Joseph, he was 17 and oblivious to what it meant to be a leader. He had a dream about his brothers and his parents bowing down to him, and that seemed just fine with him. Leadership is being honored and admired and bowed down to. That's what he thought anyway. So he told his family, hoping to get the bowing and the scraping jump started. But Joseph has had to do some growing up since then. When today's chapter starts, Joseph has been a slave with Potiphar for over 10 years. He takes responsibility and trust seriously. And when Potiphar's wife tries to get him to betray that trust, Joseph refuses. Uh, now, aside from this story being a little spicy for church, I, it's the Bible, though, isn't it? All right, anyway. I was getting embarrassed reading it. I was, like, laughing. All right. So, but it's the Bible, so I guess we can't censor it. Anyway, uh, retelling this story about Potiphar's wife makes me a little nervous. Potiphar's wife gets what she wants, or at least she escapes from the consequences of her actions by making a false accusation against Joseph, right? And every false accusation about a, an assault like this is an obstacle to the men and women who really have been hurt, who really have been attacked. Speaking out after an attack takes courage, it takes character, and a false accusation clouds the water and gives an excuse for blocking out the vi- voices of true victims and true survivors. But that being once said, once Potiphar's wife makes her accusation, she is the only one whose voice matters. As a free woman, as Potiphar's wife, her position gives her the power to speak and to be believed. You'll notice that Potiphar doesn't ask the other household slaves what they believe happened, right? They're slaves. Of course not. you notice that Potiphar doesn't ask Joseph about his side of the story. Of course not. Joseph is a slave. So even though by his hard work and God's blessing, Joseph had earned the highest place in Potiphar's household. Even though he's known Joseph for more than 10 years. Even though 10 minutes earlier, Potiphar had trusted Joseph with all his property, people, and wealth. And even though we know that Joseph gets in trouble because he's being trustworthy, all that means next to nothing when Potiphar's wife decides to speak against him. In this case, Potiphar's wife, even though she is a woman, has the upper hand over Joseph. Her class, her nationality, and her powerful husband protect her in spite of her terrible behavior. All of which is to say that when God calls us to listen to the voices of the powerless, to listen to the marginalized and the disenfranchised, it doesn't mean listen in a vacuum. It means that there are more powerful voices that are speaking too. And this is the kind of situation we want to be on the lookout for. 
But Joseph doesn't have the benefit of an impartial jury or a good defense attorney. There's no trial. He goes directly to jail. He does not pass go. But even there, even though he survived an assault on his person, even though he's disgraced and thrown away, God is still with him. And the jailer picks up where Potiphar left off, recognizing Joseph's special abilities and putting him to work, running everything. And God is with Joseph after his latest fall, when he's as low as he can get. And what Joseph does bears fruit. So here's the thing. It would be really nice if having God with you meant that bad things did not happen, right? But clearly that is not the case for Joseph. His brothers sell him into slavery, and then he's wrongly accused of a crime, and he's thrown in jail. Neither of those things is a good thing, right? Can we agree with that? In fact, they're life-altering disasters. Thank you. Thumbs up, Ryan. I appreciate that. And yet, at the same time, the story tells us again and again, God is with Joseph. And in the day-to-day, Joseph does well. He succeeds at what he does, and the people who oversee him trust him with more and more. At the annual meeting this weekend, we heard about... uh, So I was at the... I forgot to put in the announcements. Um, This weekend, I was at the Central Atlanta Conference meeting for the UCC. So this is people from all the way from Virginia up to New Jersey who go to different UCC churches, which is our denomination here. And we heard about... Hurricane Sandy, and how the recovery there is going. And only in the last few, and only in the last few weeks, tremendous tornadoes have torn through Oklahoma. And sometimes you'll hear talking heads from a particular flavor of Christianity blaming disasters on people, that something a particular group of people did caused God to punish them, or us, with a disaster. But if Joseph's story is any indication then I think we're missing where God is really at work. The people who just say that is missing where God is really at work. God is in the men and women who show up on the scene and start looking for people and hauling away the rubble. God is in the friends who listen and help pick up the pieces when our lives have been reduced to rubble. God is in kind words from a stranger and forgiveness from a family member. And God is with Joseph, blessing him, blessing his gifts, his trustworthiness, his good character, which are all traits that he developed after his terrible disasters. So here's a small thing. A couple of weeks ago, we had a freak hailstorm in our neighborhood. And it looked like, it, it was like 15 or 20 minutes of marble-sized hail. And when it was done, it looked like like an inch of snow had fallen. Right? Um, and did, did, was anybody else around when that happened? Yeah, you had it too, yeah. Um, and then I went out back into my backyard, and the lettuce in my back garden bed looked totally devastated. It was like flat, it was broken. Um, it looked like it was going to die. And so I was like, well, I don't really, I guess I'll leave it. So I left it alone to do its thing, and it grew back. And not only did it grow back, now there's tons of it. There's way more than we can eat in our family. And so that's a blessing, right? We have lettuce. We have a supply of lettuce. Um, but the real blessing is that having so much lettuce has like forced me to give it away. And so um, I've been uh, giving it away to my neighbors and like starting conversations with my neighbors um, and um, giving it away to the folks who print our bulletins every week at 6 8. Oh, thank you. Um, and I have some ideas for other recipients in the near future. It's lettuce. It's lettuce for everyone. Okay. It's not quite cotton candy, I know. But it's fresh, it's green, it's local. And I'm enjoying the blessing of being generous with it. After that hailstorm where I thought it was, you know, gone forever. So my hope for you this week is that you'll have to, the chance to either look back and see or realize and recognize right now how God is with you. Where is there lettuce springing up in your garden? What has survived a hailstorm and is keeping you nourished? What is green and growing and needs to be eaten up right now? And if you can think of something, if there's a welling in your heart, be sure you share it, because that is the best blessing of all. Thanks be to God. Amen.